Hickory dickory dock. Hickory dickory dock. Good evening and welcome to another episode of What's So Funny. I'm your host, Guy McPherson. Yeah, happy whatever. What do you say? It's not New Year's yet. We've got one hour to go. You know, I've been sitting on this interview. Our guest tonight, I'll tell you in a second, came to town uh, mid-November. I had plans to keep putting up this episode, and then live guests kept falling in my lap. So pushed it back, pushed it back. Here we are. New Year's Eve, one hour to go before midnight, and we're going to play the John Reap episode. Or if you're listening to this as a podcast, happy whatever day it is today to you, my friends. Yes, John Reap was here mid-November. He's been to Vancouver twice. Both times he has done What's So Funny. The first time, 2009, he did half an episode. And this time, 2017, does the whole thing. One hour with the hick from Hickory. But uh, he's no hayseed in real life. Hickory, in fact, isn't even a jerkwater town. No, he's from Mountain View, he'll tell us. That sounds too nice, but it's very near Hickory. Uh, He is from North Carolina. And uh, we had a good talk, fun talk. Yeah, we talked about his uh, Dodge truck commercial that he did for years, uh, his last comic standing championship season, and his perfect season in high school football. Yes, the Metro Jethro tells it all in this hour. So hope you enjoy it if you're sitting at home on a New Year's Eve listening to co-op radio, or as I said, in the future sometime on podcast. Think you'll enjoy it. My talk with John Reap. So, John, where were we when we left off? Guy! Let's see. We were at (laughs) Laugh Lines. 2009. 2009, uh, in between shows at the uh, Vancouver Comedy Festival. Boy, what memories for you, I guess. It's been a while. (laughs) Yeah, I'm not good. Let's see, 2009, 2017? Yep. Eight years. Eight years. I just did that. Just like that. You know what? I wasn't even going to attempt it because I would have my fingers going and it would be embarrassing. That was your your first time in Vancouver? It was. And this is your second? Second time in Vancouver. Yeah, I'm loving it. But it's, you know, I've been doing Canada a lot this year. Like I did Montreal again uh, this past year. Mm -hmm. I did a gala with uh, Rick Mercer which is a lot of fun. It was for, for TV as well. And then um, I did the Toronto Just for Laughs Festival, played a couple of different rooms for that, and then uh, I did Edmonton Yuck Yucks, and now I'm here. So for whatever reason, I'm on a Canada run. Yeah, you're getting out of the U.S. I, I'm, I'm done with it. <laughs> so I'm coming up here, and I also did a, 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 what they call the Just for Laughs Road Show. With a couple of people, um, the road show. The road show. We we just did a lot of uh, uh, gigs for about I don't know two or three weeks. What all province? Over. Was I that knew, Ontario? I knew you were going to ask me that. Yes, it was. Yes, it was. As soon as you said it, <laughs> I saved you. Yes, you did. Thank you, guy. Um, yeah, because we don't get that here. We get a couple of different tours. Like tonight, yeah. when we're recording this a few weeks ago now, right? There's the JFL. Alternative tour with T.J. Miller and Reese Darby, right? And, and they do that here or no? Nick Vaderot, okay. Vaderot, correct. Uh, I don't know. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> I was pretending he, to save you. <laughs> yeah, they did, they're coming here tonight. Oh, okay. And and then in October they had the JFL comedy tour. I think Alonzo Bowden. Oh, and, Alonzo, uh, I love him. Yeah. Another uh, compatriot of yours from Last Comic Standing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he's not, actually not na- the same year. Not the same year, but he was a judge on my season. Ah, and he's my neighbor. We uh, oh, really we actually live in the same townhome complex. Wow. Do, yeah. Do his motorbikes wake you up? He's a little further down, so I don't I don't hear him. And we're both you know we're ships passing in the night. We're both on the road a lot, so I hardly ever see him. 
I actually see more at festivals in Canada than I do in our own neighborhood. Yeah, he plays here a lot. He does. And he does a lot of uh, cruise ships. Uh Um, And he actually hooked me up with one that I do now. These theme cruises. Like, he does the jazz cruise. He does the smooth jazz. And the smooth jazz cruise. (laughs) Yeah. And he does another one. He's got three locked down that are just his. But the same people who booked that also book another one called the Country Music Cruise. Perfect. And he goes, that ain't in my wheelhouse. <laughs> and so <laughs> he goes, uh, I thought I'd, he, he hooked me up with those people. And now it'll be my, my third time doing it uh, this February. So uh, thank you, Alonzo. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I forgot that you were a Last Comic Standing winner. Yeah. And so there's, I don't know how many seasons there were, eight? 10? Yeah, uh, I, I was season five, two thousand seven, and then I think after that there was maybe four or five. You know, it would cancel and it would come back. Yeah, and it would leave again and come back. So, and I stopped paying attention after Felipe Esparza. Like after him, I just I know there were other ones, but I, I well, I liked the last one when Norm Macdonald was a judge. Yeah, he was very that was interesting. honest. Yeah. And, um, uh, helpful and yeah. at times, you know, yeah. uh, brutally honest. People didn't know how people. to take him sometimes. You yeah. know? They didn't understand if he was being sarcastic or serious. But that was a couple of years ago. It hasn't been back on. But, you know, I know in the last few years, I don't know if they did this with your year, uh, they would take the top three or four or whatever and go on tour. Yeah. That's what they, they did that year. They mm-hmm. did that year. year. Now did. I think what they should do is take all the winners and go on tour. Well, my agent. Uh, also has uh, some of the winners in his roster, mm-hmm. and he he tried to build a couple of those shows called the Winner Circle. Yeah, and so it was me and Alonzo, uh, who else? John Heffron. Yeah, and then a uh, uh, Dat fan would come on, and it would uh, Dude, Eliza. He, he needs the work. Eliza Schlesinger. Yeah, um, but yeah, we've we've done a couple of those already. But that would be good if it was really really organized by. NBC or yeah, yeah. Less, less comic standing people. Yeah. Yeah, that would be smart. You could even come up to Canada. I, You know what? I'm not leaving, so they're going to have to come up here. <laughs> um, so you were, you're, we're doing this uh, talking in the morning. Yeah. Now, I guess you're traveling a lot, so you got to get up and make airplanes. Correct. And you were doing some commercial radio today. I did. Yeah? How'd that go? Great. Yeah? Uh, something the peak. Yeah. Uh, good guys. Uh, Are they? Yeah. We switched frequencies. We're on a, a co-op radio station, and a few years ago, we switched frequencies, so they now have our old frequency. Oh. We have their frequency. Do you know them? Or no, I don't know them. Okay. Good yeah. guys. I mean, I, you know, I, I never know what to expect morning radio. Sometimes... People are miserable. They already hate comedians, and they just have to deal with it. And sometimes they're actually like in a good mood and kind of, you know, they kind of knew who I was anyway. So it was not, it was easy walking into that when they, you know, they they had already looked up a video of me um, getting kicked out of a Carolina Panthers football game for dancing in the end zone. <laughs> you got uh, arrested for that, didn't you? I, well, no, I just got kicked out. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. I got questioned. I got detained for dancing in the end zone. I, yeah, I was. Uh, you can't celebrate. Well, you know now that they, they it's back. You can celebrate this year. They brought it back. Okay, but uh, yeah. Well, the, the short story is, I got invited onto the field by the mascot, he to dance with him. He had waved me out there, but the the cops didn't see the invitation. And then we found out later he didn't have the authority anyway to right. invite me out there. So as I'm dancing, uh, I'm doing the worm on the five yard line. Two cops come up behind me and give me a full on wedgie and uh, <laughs> march me 99 yards to the other end zone by the back of my pants. And Never you missed the go. game. I missed the I missed the fourth quarter. Yeah, right. <laughs> but yeah, that was the first year that the Panthers were in the NFL. It was their very first year, so. Uh, the, I guess the Panthers, including the mascot, was uh, learning the rules as they went. Where do you live now? I live in Los Angeles. Okay, Studio City. So this isn't you don't you're not in Florida. No, you were just there. Uh, yeah, I'm there a lot. I mean, I, yeah. I, I play there quite a bit. Right. Um, where was I? I was in L.A. I had the last couple of weeks off in L.A. Um, trying to. You know, I'm doing a lot of voiceover auditions and random auditions. Actually, I, I have uh, sides printed out over there for an audition. I got a tape for myself today and send in. for. And I was hoping you could read the other lines. Sure, I'd love to. <laughs> All right, good. It could be my big break. Yeah, hey, this is it. We'll, we'll, we'll put both of us on tape and see what happens. <laughs> so you, you do uh, country cruises or a cruise. Yeah, now. I just do this one. Now, now, 
listeners, if they're not familiar with John Reap, he has a bit of a southern accent. You're I do. From Hickory. Hickory! Hickory, you North know, Carolina. That's correct. Uh, now, you know, we're from the big city here in Vancouver. Yeah. How big is Hickory? Hickory, um, well, I make it sound tiny. I mean, I've sort of made fun of it just because the way it sounds. Hickory, it's got the word hick, hick in, it. in it. Yeah. yeah. But uh, it's actually, let's see, I think it's the fourth or fifth largest city in North Carolina. Um, it used to be the furniture capital of the world. Um, <laughs> it's home to Winston Cup champion Del Jarrett, yeah. NASCAR legend. And John Reap. And me. And the pig from Green Acres. Oh, Arnold. <laughs> oh, no, it's about Zsa Zsa. <laughs> Just oh, kidding. Ah. Only but a goody. <laughs> no, it's uh it's not I make it sound tiny, but it's probably like, I don't know, hundred and twenty five thousand people. Yeah. Something like that. What was it like growing up there? It was great. I I picture North Carolina as really beautiful. It it is, honestly. Yeah. I mean you've no, got I do. The, you got the Appalachian Mountains on the west coast that yeah. run through there, so you got nice views like this. Not as good as that, but some nice mountains. Yeah. And then if you go all the way to the uh to the east coast You've got the the ocean. You've got the uh, the Atlantic Ocean right there. Good good beaches, and everything in between. You know, it's you got the foothills. You got the plains. You got the mountains and the ocean. You get all four seasons. I mean, uh, you get a decent summer, decent fall, decent spring, and and uh, winter. Mm-hmm. I mean, the winter's not like you know we we it might snow once, but that's about it. Yeah. Um. But it, it, yeah, it is really it's beautiful. A lot of a lot of trees, very green. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's not really. I mean, uh, how do how do you say you paint it as this uh, tiny little hick yeah, town? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But oh, do the people well, there the, appreciate you just saying that? They do because it's like they're getting talked about. Okay, <laughs> and so they're in on it. Yeah. You know, it's kind of funny. Like the the area that I grew up in is actually what I'm talking about. Hickory is the city. I actually live on the outskirts in an area called Mountain View, which is actually closer to a town called Newton. And that's where I grew up. And so in my act, when I'm saying Hickory, I'm actually talking about Mountain View. But Mountain View actually sounds nice. It Hickory does. sounds hilarious. <laughs> so that's why I use that. But I, I'm guessing you got a nice view of the mountain there. You, we, got, we got one. See, we're far from the Appalachian Mountains, about an hour. So you can't really see those mountains. But in Hickory slash Newton, there's one <laughs> mountain it's more of a hill. It's called Baker's Mountain, um, and it's just one mountain, so that's the view. Yeah. <laughs> do you get back often? I do. I get back uh, Thanksgiving and Christmas. I'll be back uh, both uh, times for that. And I try to, you know, um, I'm a big Panthers, Carolina Panthers football fan, and that's an hour from where I grew up. So I always, and I'm good, I'm, I have a good relationship with the club there. So I always book myself for a night game. That weekend, and then uh-huh. I'll use that as a as an excuse to visit the family as well. Oh, so so you were dancing in the end zone yeah. at the Panthers game. In my head, I'm going Florida Panthers. No, that's Jaguars. Yeah, see, yeah. so that's why I said you I, live I, in Florida. Got it. Yeah, uh, I, mean, that, I see that that happens. It's a feline. Does it happen? It it's a cat. It doesn't happen. Well, is, it's understandable. Is there, is there a Florida Panthers? There, I it think there like, is a Florida Panthers hockey team. Oh, that's it. Or maybe and maybe there's a Florida Panthers. There is a Florida Panthers something. Yeah, look at me, the Canadian. Assuming. <laughs> you should know about hockey. I should. <laughs> I don't know a lot. We could Google it. Let's find out. Let's ask Siri. Hang on. Let's see. Is there a Florida Panthers? And it says, hey, I got Lucy in here. It's, yep. Yeah, that's hockey. They Panthers play, the, play Kings. the Kings. There you go. So you were... Okay. Now, now it all makes sense. It makes sense. Full circle. But, but you were back home uh, visiting your favorite team, yes. Carolina Panthers. That's correct. Were, were they an expansion team? Yes. Okay. They ca- and they came out the same time as the Jaguars did. Okay. That's in Florida. Yeah. I wouldn't so. have been able to guess Jaguars. Yeah. It's weird that two teams came out the same time and they're both cats. Yeah. Like, I didn't like that. Are there Panthers in North Carolina? I would assume, I, and that's another one. I don't. I don't are even there, know why we're the Panthers. Are there jaguars in Florida? I would assume so. Maybe at least in the zoos. No, yeah, well, that doesn't <laughs> count. Everyone. Yeah. But I don't know. I, you know, we we had the Vancouver Grizzlies. Oh, I don't think there are Grizzlies in Vancouver. No, this was the NBA. Okay, and now they're in Memphis. Oh, right. right. Well, I would, and I mean, there's no probably no Grizzlies in Memphis. I, I would, again, the zoo. Oh, Memphis. 
No, not in Memphis. It'd be the outskirts. They should name it more appropriate, like, you know, like the Mets. You know, the New York Mets, Metropolis. We get that. Oh, I was thinking the opera. <laughs> right. The, the, mas- the, the opera should have mascots. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, they got that one guy with the half a face, but that's it. Yeah. You're listening to What's So Funny on CFRO 100.5 FM Vancouver Co-op Radio. I'm Guy McPherson, and our guest this week is stand-up comedian John Reap. And uh, you went to Fred T. Ford High School. Oh, my gosh. Yes, yes uh, I did. Go Tigers. Go Tigers! Another cat! <laughs> yes, <laughs> my... Uh, but you played football. I did. I certainly did. In my senior year, we had a perfect season. We went 0-10. <laughs> oh, that's kind of perfect. We lost every game we played. Because, you know, I, 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 I saw on the internet Fred T. Ford, and they, they are uh, proudly, they, they've had many champions over the years. Oh. I think 11 Do uh, tell. girls volleyball championships. Yes. yes. A few basketball. Basketball. Never football. 0-10. and 10. Uh, 0 and 10. We, I like to say we went defeated. <laughs> and we had this coach who uh my senior year who came in and just he just did one year he was horrible i mean just berated i mean he didn't know how to coach kids but right? he was not like a like a, a high school coach yeah you, and gotta, you were like 16 17 yeah you gotta kind of mis- yeah we already thought we sucked so we didn't need to be reminded at all times that we suck anyway he didn't help people quit people got hurt I ended up playing four or five different positions. I had no business trying to be a middle linebacker. I was getting killed. And our closest game was the very last game, and we were also playing another team that had not won a game. So you got two defeated teams playing each other the mm-hmm. last game. And Someone going, had to win. Yeah. <laughs> and Overtime. Zero the other zero. T- <laughs> it went to the last play. Zero to three. <laughs> and they beat us by, with a field goal, and it was horrible. But this year, I'm proud to say, that they are in the playoffs for the first time since, like, the 80s. My high school, Fifty Ford High School, is wow. in the playoffs. So they, uh, they're, they like, 9-3 and three or something like that right now. So tonight, as we speak, they're playing a game. So oh, Otherwise, you'd be there dancing in the end I zone. I would go and support the home team if I were there. I certainly would. Yeah. They supported me when I was in the – in the runnings for the last, you know, last comic standing. Uh, they actually, a lot of my friends and family and people in the high school did a viewing party of the very, when it came down to me and Lavelle Crawford, the announcement, they had a big screen in the gym and everyone was watching it. And then the announcement, you know, where I won and then the whole gym went crazy. Wow. Uh, it's really, there's a video of it on uh, the YouTube that still get, chokes me up. Nice. You know? Yeah. So, yeah, uh, and I went back and gave did like, did like a little speech for the juniors and seniors after I won and all that stuff. So, yeah, I would be there. I would be there if I could. Mm-hmm. Yeah, when you're when you're sitting at zero and four, yeah, yeah. And do you think well we're never going to win a game, or you just go oh, you know they were we well, could have had one of those early games. We're going to turn it around. The, here's what okay. So the very first game, we and we thought like. We're we're good. We got a new coach. We got some new offensive schemes. Uh, we got a couple guys back that are good. We thought we'd win at least half our games, but that first game was so demoralizing. We got beat fifty eight to six the very first game, mm. and then the coach was like, "He that next day in practice was hell." Now the next game we played, we almost should have won. It was like we had a couple fumbles. You know, we could have, should have won that game. And if we had won that second game, I do believe we would have, would have you know, confidence. We would have won some other games. But, you know, after that, after losing the second game that close, it was like, and then the coach got really pissy. And then, he, you know, he made, he made uh, us do these drills. We had a really good running back named Aaron Weaver who was, like, fast but small, you know. And he... It wasn't tough for enough for the coach. Like, he wanted this guy to learn how to take hits. Mm. And so he'd, get out, he'd drag out mattresses and make, make the running back stand in front of the mattress with their head down and just learn how to take a hit. And we would all, like, you know, one by one line up five yards away from the running back and just take off and hit him as hard as we could. And they had to stand there and take it. And this guy got hit like five or six times. He goes, fuck this. Took his helmet off and said, I quit. And oh, that was our really? number one running back. That was the... 
uh, week three. <laughs> Reap, get in there. Yeah. We need a running back. <laughs> yeah. So I did. I actually played running back a couple times. You did? Yeah. There's a my uh, dad would come and record the games with a camcorder. OG still have those? Yeah. There's one tape. <laughs> I, I wish I could show it to you now. My my dad's friends were the Sunday school class. So he's up there watching the game with all of them and he's recording this. And <laughs> this was the second game, by the way, the one that we could have should have won, right? I recovered a fumble, and everyone's like, yeah. And then uh, the coach goes like, all right, Reap, I'm putting you in a uh, running back. Don't fumble. And I go, <laughs> you got it, coach. And I go in, and, and it, now the, if you're watching the tape, you hear my, my dad and his friends go like, oh, look, look, John's coming in at running back. Oh, oh, look at that. And then the play develops, and it's you see that I'm getting the ball. And it's like a sweep to out to the outside, yeah. and I'm running, I'm running, and you hear the crowd like, run that ball, Reap, run that ball! And then this dude came out of nowhere. He got this grizzly ball, just hit me right in the chest. The ball bounced in the air. <laughs> and I saw my feet and the ball above my head, me trying to grasp it, and I fumbled. And it was the – but the tape's like, run that ball, run that ball, run Oh. <laughs> And everyone just got quiet. But that was the end of the half. And See, we, that, we was, didn't, that was we, some good foreshadowing by Coach. <laughs> don't fumble. Don't. I know. He put well, it in my head. Whatever you do. Yeah. Don't put salt in your eye. Do put salt in my eye? Right. One of those things where you say don't, and you hear the next word. That's all you hear is that next word. Did he have some choice words for you when you came back to the Oh, home? yeah. He grabbed me by the face mask and jerked me around. Oh, that's, that's, that's you can't do that fun. anymore. Yeah. Well, this guy went on to, like, coach uh, uh, at Indiana. The university. Yeah. He's been fired several times from different jobs for, like, berating even the college kids. Like, you know, he's kind of like uh, – who's that – the basketball coach I'm thinking of? Bobby Knight. But he's like the the, the football version of Bobby Knight. Wow. Um, and he's, Same school, Indiana. How weird is that? Yeah. They, they're, the Indiana's got some S&M problems. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I know what little I know about uh, college football and high school football. From Friday Night Lights, right? Uh, that the communities, especially in the South, mm-hmm. really rally around, and like everyone comes out to a game. That's right. How many would you get at your game? Well, unfortunately for us, Fred T. Ford has been a perennial loser at football. So our football games are not as big as our basketball games. Our yeah. basketball game, we're more of a basketball school until this year when they start winning. But I mean, you'd probably get. If it were packed, you could probably get, I don't know, maybe maybe a 1,000 people. Oh, okay. Like that. Nothing crazy. But I know but some Texas, places have stadiums. Texas. That's yeah. what you're thinking. Texas is high school football country. Yeah. They they they, they love that more than the, the college a lot of times. Mm-hmm. Um, so, unfortunately, that's not us because I, 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 that football is my favorite sport. I would have rather it been that than basketball. Basketball is my favorite. Is it? Well, you're tall. You look like you could actually play some basketball. I, 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 I couldn't rebound. <laughs> I was useless at basketball. Do you know who Fred T. Ford was or is? I used to. He owned a lot of land. Okay. I, I believe he was a farmer that owned a lot of land, um, and that's all I that's all I can remember. And that might not, not even be accurate, but. They named the school after him, I think, because he owned the land or something. But Fred T. Ford is sort of like – there's a couple of high schools in Hickory. they got Hickory High, and you got Fred T. Ford. Hickory High, wasn't that in the Hoosiers? That's right. Speaking of Indiana, how crazy. But not the same Hickory No, there's a, there is a Hickory or a Hickville or a Hicks or a Hickton in every state in the country. Um, but – so there's a couple of hickories out there, yeah, and there is one in Indiana as well, and okay. that's that's based on on that movie. But Fred T. Ford High School would be your redneck school. <laughs> Lots of future farmers of America. They actually have a day where everyone drives a tractor and they park it in the in the front lawn. Um, <laughs> so that's that's the high school I went to, Redneck High. Yeah, I went to Redneck High. Um, <laughs> even though I, I I didn't even consider myself that at all. Was your family? What did they do? My dad was, uh, when I was a kid, from like, he was a cop for a while. He was a deputy sheriff mm. until he got shot and almost died. Yikes. Yeah. Uh, he's alive. He's fine. But he was in the hospital for a couple of years. Just How getting, old were you? I was like six, six or seven. Tough on the family. Yeah, it was yeah. crazy. I remember uh, 
waking up one Saturday morning and there's just a babysitter in my house. And I'm like, who are you? She goes, well, I'm the babysitter. I was like, where's my mom? She's at the hospital. And I started freaking out. What's wrong with my mom? What's wrong with my mom? And she goes, nothing. Your mom's fine. I go, oh, well, where's my dad? <laughs> oh, he got shot. What? You know, uh, so it was a crazy time. Um, I'll tell you what happened. So, like, he was he was kind of, like, off duty. At the, he was off duty, but he, all cops have the scanner on or whatever. So he's riding around, and he hears that there is a domestic dispute call, and he just knew that he happened to be the closest one to that house. So he thought he'd at least go check on the girl that was, you know, allegedly getting beat up by her husband or something. So he goes there. And then uh, I guess a fight happens, and um, the, there's a tussle, there's a chase, and uh, this guy, and it was at night, and this guy had ran and hid behind a wood pile or something, and my dad, like, snuck around another building and, and basically positioned himself right behind the guy. And the guy was, like, on his knees, and my dad just walked up right behind him and had his gun out, and he goes, all right, it's over, raise your hands. So when that guy raised his hands, my dad did not know that he had a twenty two in his hand. So when he raised his hands, he just fired haphazardly over his head, but just, you know, hoping to hit something. So, and he hit one bullet, hit him right in the stomach. One, one hit him in the hand, one missed. And then my dad fired back as he was getting shot, killed that guy. And then he just laid there and, and it was sent to the hospital. They rewired his intestines incorrectly. So, he had to wear a colostomy bag, and then they had to go do another surgery because he had septic shock, like he was poisoning himself with his own waste. And then so, and then he got addicted to morphine for a while, had to come off that. So it was a crazy two years. But the only funny part about this is my dad's shaped like me. He got a little bit of a, a little bit of a gut here, you know, nothing crazy, but there's a little bit. But he's got these scars now. He's got one scar that goes all the way from like right between his. Uh, tits all the way down to his belly. I think that's the medical term. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And then he's got another scar that goes across the belly button the other way, and another one because he had to go back in. Right. So it looks like he's got a built-in six-pack, <laughs> no, but it's on top of this gut. So when he goes to the beach, he'll you know take his shirt off and go, "Hell yeah, I earned this six-pack." <laughs> yeah. But uh, it's that... in liquid form. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but that then he you know, after that he retired. Um, and then uh, for most of my life, he was the manager of a Goodyear tire shop. So, um, and then I, I worked there a couple of years um, as well. But yeah, most of my life, manager of a Goodyear. Mom was uh, like a, a secretary, a receptionist at a couple, couple different places. But both parents worked. And, and uh, did they have a good sense of humor? Like when you guys were going oh and eight, nine, yeah. ten, were you getting your balls busted at home? No, no. Mom didn't care. Mom just loved her family. Mom and she didn't want you to get hurt. Didn't want me to get hurt, yeah. but she knew how much I loved football. So you know, she was uh, sympathetic, uh, but not you know. She just basically just wanted her kids to be around and, and enjoy their life and and uh, felt loved, you know. But dad, dad, dad's got the sense of humor. Mm -hmm. All right, dad's a funny one. I mean, w when he was in high school, he was you know they have senior superlatives. He was like most wittiest or something. When I was in high, my senior year, I got class clown. And then a year after me, my brother got the same thing. So uh -huh. I don't know if it's genetic or it's in the blood, but it, maybe we were taught it from him. But he's funny. My dad's funny, but... Legitimately. Yeah, but not like on purpose all the time. Oh, okay. To be, it's like a real funny. Like, just he's just a funny guy. But he's, he's, he's not thought out. It's just the way he is. What about action. your brother? What does he do? My brother's funny, too, but he's more thought out. Like, growing up, we're only a year and a half apart. So if we were at a party, I would be the guy on the table with my pants around my ankles. Without even thinking. And he'd be the guy like, no, 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 but uh, take your shirt off, too, and then say this. Like, he would add to it. <laughs> like, he would come up with funnier things. But I was the I was the, the I was the guy doing it, so that's Jason. But uh, he's he's smarter than me. He is a uh, structural engineer. Oh, yeah, uh, he's good at math. He's he's more like mom. I'm more like dad. You're listening to What's So Funny on CFRO 100.5 FM Vancouver Co-op Radio. I'm Guy McPherson, and our guest this week is stand-up comedian John Reap. 
Well, I know that uh, you you went you got into TV production and you went to school for theater. I did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you weren't in stand up, mm -hmm. you would be involved in show business somehow. Yeah, I would be behind the camera. I would be the last job job I had was working at a TV station. Yeah, in Raleigh, North Carolina. UNC. Yeah, UNC TV. It's like their PBS. You know, of North Carolina, each yeah. state has its own little PBS, and and you were behind the camera. Yeah, I worked on a couple different shows. One was called North Carolina Now. It's like a PM magazine all about North Carolina, and then another one was called Legislative Week in Review. <laughs> Snooze fest for me growing up at that time, but I was the assistant director of those shows. Which really, it sounds cool, but really, you're just keeping time. With each package, the whole run of the show, and make sure everything times out exactly right, and when to put the little names at the bottom and the little the logos and all that kind of crap. But that's the last job job I had, so I'd probably still be doing that. Maybe had worked up to something else. I don't know, but that was it was an easy job. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, assistant director, you mean? But you would have moved up to maybe director, maybe or producer. I, I would have. Uh, I would have hoped to have done something else other than. Uh, you know, it's funny. I was actually kind of like getting my way up to the uh, to the actual um, the writing phase of things for uh, the, a lot of the producers, especially for this one, the one show, North Carolina Now. So my dad uh, was a huge fan of the show Andy Griffith, the Andy Griffith show. Who wasn't? Thank you. Yeah. One of the best shows to have ever existed. Um, that whistling theme. Yeah, we won't do it, but you know it. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! Oh, that's it. <laughs> yeah. So my dad, as I was, was a fan of the show, and so he, you know, ended up buying an exact replica of the squad car from that show, and he got the decals. He would go to Mayberry Day festivals and meet some of the old cast. He had them sign the dash, and there's this one. Uh, uh, town, uh, Mount Airy, basically, basically it, it's based on the show, and they have uh, like a festival every year. We call it Mayberry Days. Hmm. And so my dad, still, would, yeah, wow. And they they got guys who look just like Otis. They got guys who who <laughs> do killer Bonnie Fife impressions. There's a parade. They have the whole pickle queen, and there's all kinds of stuff. Wow. So my dad would go there every year with his squad car and be in the parade and lead it and all this stuff and. And so I'm thinking, well, wh why isn't North Carolina now covering this for the show? I mean, this is totally huge. This is all, I mean, one of the best shows of all time based about this, and you're not even talking about it. So I went and wrote up a whole thing, and, you know, so I got to be a producer once, and I produced a piece uh, on my dad. You know, basically now a way of me covering my dad. Yeah. And I went there, and, and uh, it was in the show. But um, because I got red hair, and I'm in the car with him, I'm automatically Opie, whether I like it or not. So I'm out there throwing candy at people from the squad car, you know, with a camera, and people are like, hey, and it's Opie. I'm like, no, I'm not, I got. So that was very. I'm a producer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like Ron Howard. <laughs> oh, that's true. Yeah. You didn't have the beard then. I didn't have the beard. No, I was yeah. a fresher, younger Ron Howard with hair. Yeah, I know that was a good show, and that's good that it's keeping it alive. I yeah. guess even young kids are watching it. Yeah, there. Uh, I suppose. I mean, it's always on somewhere. TV Land, I think, still yeah. airs it. Um, you know, it's, I mean, Barney Fife, one of the best characters of all time. Uh, that guy's Don Knotts just makes me laugh. So, yeah, it's 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 still on. Dad still likes it. He got rid of the car, but, but you know. That's Aunt B. Aunt B, right? Yeah. A weird relationship, too. <laughs> like, Andy Griff was not married. Uh, always kind of single. Had girlfriends here and there. Lived with his aunt. And his now, son. He's a single dad. So it was Opie's great aunt then. Right. It wasn't it, it wasn't, wasn't Andy's sister. It wasn't Andy's sister. Yeah. It was like his mom's sister. Yeah, we never uh, I'm not even sure. Well, to but be you honest know, with back you. in those days, you you called friends of your relatives right. aunt and uncle. Yeah. Uh so maybe she was just Maybe somebody she... <laughs> who looked after the house, and they called her Aunt B. You know what? I'm sure we can find out, but I don't that, know. that could be. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. Aunt B, maybe. <laughs> uh, so when did you get into stand-up from producing legislature shows or Legislative assistant directing? Week, yeah. 
Yeah, so I uh, I was doing stand up at night. Oh, you were. So while I was you just had to get out of that environment. I figured, like, well, that's why when I went to school at North Carolina State University, I barely got in that. Jim school. Valvano, Jimmy V. That's right. You were there just after him. I was after him. Yeah, yeah. I, I actually was there when he came back to give a speech uh, during a basketball game right before he died, mm-hmm. and it was not a dry eye in that house. Yeah, yeah, like it was very sad. I mean, he was he died like a week later. Um, but I, that's where I went to school. I barely got in. There's this thing called the lifelong program that NC State used to have, don't have anymore, where anybody off the street could go and take two classes and a PE. And if you do well, they might admit you as a full time sort of regular student. Like a trial. Yeah. And so I talked my parents into letting me do that. So for like a year and a half, I was trying to get in NC State. And then once I finally did, I had to choose a major, and I had no idea what I was going to choose. I was just happy to be in a college and want a college degree. So I thought, well, I better take something easy because it was hard getting in. <laughs> and I'm like, well, what's the easiest major? And I'm looking around. I'm like, well, what are the athletes taking? They're usually pretty dumb like me. Uh, what are they doing? And it was communication. And I thought, all right, I'll just do communication. And then theater was one of those things. And so – I chose theater only because I thought it would be easy. And was it? For me, not as hard as for some people. Like, I didn't really care, which kind of helps, I think. Because if you care too much, you get nervous. And if you're nervous, it doesn't. That you get doesn't, self-conscious. Yeah, too, and then yeah. you're not in the moment. You're not yeah. being a good actor. So if you don't really care, and you're just it's just good lying. <laughs> you know, so Pretending. I'm pretty good at that, <laughs> uh, I guess. No, I, I, I took a couple of, you know, that was my major. And I I remember the first class, uh, acting class that we took, we did a scene. And everyone after that was like, oh, man, I want to do a scene with that guy. So I was kind of like, you know, but but the, but also the people who were already doing plays, they, they're a little snobby. They got their own little clique. Sure. And then like this outsider fake looking jock guy coming in here. You know, trying to trying to steal spots and plays. So I never really did much of a play thing. I was just sort of in the major with the theater. You know, with the theater department, uh, did one play, but nothing really crazy. But so I was a theater major, and I was uh, working at UNC TV. You know, so I had some some skill. I was thinking, well, if I get a job behind the camera and I'm doing stuff in front of the camera, maybe one day these will merge and I will be in front of the camera. Which is kind of back of my head, kind of a dream I had. And so when I got kicked out of that Panthers game, and I had been talking about doing stand up. Oh, so this was before. Yeah, the... I hadn't I hadn't done stand up when I got kicked out of that game, but I had been talking about doing stand up. And I had a buddy who finally got tired of hearing it, and he goes, "Well, shut up or do it. I'm tired of hearing about it." And you just made seventy five thousand people laugh without saying one word. Biggest show, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you, maybe you want to go up there and just talk about that. And I go, "All right." So I finally did it. And I went up on an open mic night. It was a club in Raleigh called Charlie Good Nights. Uh, now it's just called Good Nights. But I that was my first time on stage, and and I just sort of uh, fell in love with it. I remember um, that same guy Marty, who was, Marty's like my biggest fan. Like he laughs at anything I say, even when I'm not trying to be funny. He just like laughs at everything, right? So he's the best audience. And I went there on an open mic night. And it was probably like you know twenty, thirty people in this crowd. The MC went up there and he goes, all right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this next act, it's his first time on stage. And I'm like, God, I didn't want him to tell him that because now they're nervous for you mm-hmm. or they're expecting you to suck. I didn't want them to know it was my first time. So I'm in the back. I'm like, God damn it. And so he introduces me. And back then I thought it'd be funny to run up there and fall down. And I, you know, I was kind of a physical guy and. And I was a big Chris Farley fan, and I thought I'd run up there and just bust my ass, and that would get a laugh. Pull your pants down. <laughs> yeah, right, right. So I I ran up on stage, and I fell down. And to my credit, it was a good fall, but it was so good that the audience did not laugh at me. They thought they felt sorry for me, and they go, oh, no, it's his first time. So uh, uh, I got uh, I ran on stage. I fell down on uh, purpose. On purpose, but people thought it was real. And instead of laughing, they felt sorry for me. <gasps> they were they got a big gasp. gasp. And I'm like, I got, and I stood up. I was like, No, I did it on purpose. Shit! And then I kept talking, and I had the microphone way over here. No one could, could hear what I'm saying, you know. So I did a lot of that. So no one was really laughing except for like maybe the one or two people in the front row. 
But Marty was in the back taping this. And I don't know where this tape is today, but I remember watching it later. And I'm watching watching myself bomb. And I'd do a joke and no one would laugh. But Marty would laugh in the very back with the camera. Like, I'd do a joke. It would not work. But the camera would shake and hear. <laughs> <laughs> so Mar- Marty's sort of uh, pushed me into it and uh, been uh, my biggest fan ever since, since day one. And then your, bre- your brother's been writing your material. <laughs> yeah. He kind of wrote it in the beginning, and then he just said, I'm done. I never, I don't even have many jokes about my brother at all, but uh, I should dabble into that. Most of my stuff's about my dad, uh, and I, I won't really talk about my mom too much because, you know, she's a saint, and she's, you know, she's she, she's perfect, so I can't find anything. Well, there's some comedy <laughs> to be mined there, I guess. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. Yeah, but, I mean, from that first time when you were just physical, uh-huh. And, you know, goofy and yeah. full of life. You had to uh, eventually come up with, with material. Yeah, yeah, And totally. how long did that take? Well, I, well, there was a uh, – at Good Nights, they were taking – were, there was a comedy class that you could take. And so uh, I was very against it at first. I'm thinking, oh, this is dumb. I, 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 I need someone to tell me how to be funny. I made 75,000 people laugh. Yeah. I'm a professional. <laughs> Sir Purs, I'm a biggest fan. So I'm thinking, uh, I kind of avoided it, and I'd sign up on open mics and get up sometimes and do okay or whatever. I'd just basically tell stories. Like I'd, something would happen or in my life and sort of try and make that funny, you know. But uh, I remember a guy who was running the class. He's like, look, if you want to get on stage, you got to take my class. And believe me, I know you don't think this, but it'll help. And I go, all right, fine. So I took his class, and it totally did help, you know. Just little stuff. Just like, some, move the mic out of, out of the way. Oh, some technical There's stuff. A lot of technical stuff. And, he, you know, even, like, trying to save the funniest word for the very last thing that you say. Yeah. Don't 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 talk over when people are laughing. Like, a little basic stuff. And, and, and so he helped me be a better sort of, you know, ri- I guess a writer in a weird, weird way. And I I, I I have some jokey jokes, but I'm mostly a story guy. And the you know the, through repetition, the more you do something, the better you get. The more you add, and and I find like for me, like being on stage doing like you know the same joke uh, over and over again, you will find little nuances within it that you didn't expect, but the crowd will laugh at, and you go like, oh, I got to keep that. I remember that. I've, I raised that eyebrow there, and that right. so like Pavlov's dog. Though. Yeah, every so, time that bell rings. <laughs> oh, that's well, those what I those guys do. too, like who just trigger it, you know. But I'm thinking like more of like not jokes, but stories. Mm-hmm. Like stories can evolve and change, and and stuff like that. Well, for me, like, and I love all forms of comedy. Like, if it's funny, it's funny. I don't care how you get the laugh as long as it's funny. I agree. I that's all I care about. So there are great joke tellers who just tell joke, joke, jokes. And there are guys who, who are great storytellers. Um, and I, I, I'm more of a storyteller kind of guy. I've got some jokes in there, but I, I prefer stories because they last longer. Like if you're just telling a joke and you're not adding anything else to it, then it's like once you hear it, you hear it. But if it's a story and it changes and evolves and there's physical parts to it and – you tell a friend like, "Oh, you got to hear the story." Like, if you tell the joke, then that's it. But if you tell a friend like, "You got to come see this guy and hear the story," because they can't do it justice, mm-hmm. then I think it lives longer. Yeah, it has more o- longevity. The only downside would be is that you're locked into this story, and if yeah. it's not going well, and then, then that well, sucks. I got ten more minutes on this story. <laughs> <laughs> I've been there before too. <laughs> like, <laughs> right in the middle of the story, you're thinking like, "Shit." There's four more minutes of this. How do I get out? I've bailed out of them before too. Oh yeah, I'm like hey, you got. I'm just like you're right, guys. That's dumb. Anyway, mm-hmm. <laughs> just kind of bailed out. And then I've had people like, no, well, how's this going to end? And then, sometimes you find even when they're not laughing, they're at least listening. Exactly, and they're curious, and yeah. they're like, uh, you got to end this damn thing. Yeah. <laughs> You're listening to What's So Funny on CFRO 100.5 FM Vancouver Co-op Radio. I'm Guy McPherson, and our guest this week is stand-up comedian John Reap. Were you, uh, when you were starting out in Rally, was Paul Hooper there? Paul Hooper, yes. You guys around the same? He was, um, 
I don't know. Yeah, we we were. Uh, he's more. I think more of a Charlotte guy. Oh, that's he. Yeah, and Raleigh and Charlotte's about two and a half, three hours apart from each other. Oh, okay. You had the comedy zones in Charlotte, and you had good nights in Raleigh, and it was weird. Like it was like you know little. Little rivalries, you know. Mm-hmm. If you start a good night, you can't do the companies, which is dumb. They don't do that anymore. But I think Hooper was a Charlotte guy. But I, I I've gotten to know him over the years. Yeah. Um, but we didn't start at the same time. Oddly enough, you know, uh, w- when I started, uh, there were some famous people who were coming in and out of that club. Yeah. Who? You had uh, a Retta from Parks and Recreation. You know Retta, the the big black girl. Okay. So she she started there. Um, you had Jeff Richards, who was on a- a- SNL for two years. Oh, wow. Uh, he was also – well, he's one of the only guys to be hired and fired from both Mad TV and SNL. <laughs> <laughs> um, Point of pride. Yep. You had uh, – well, Zach Galifianakis came in there once or twice. Oh, yeah. He's North Carolina, North too. North Carolina guy. Went to Raleigh there for a little bit. Yeah. Um, Ken, Ken Jung. Um, was going to school in Chapel Hill. Medical. Yep. He was getting his uh, doctorate, I guess, and then uh, would come in there a couple times and do jokes. And I think that's it that you guys would know. But, yeah, uh, but that's the Raleigh side, you know. Um, Charlotte, uh, Paul uh, Hooper, and I can't think of anybody else. Well, I'm sure there is somebody big that can. Clearly, make. Raleigh was superior. <laughs> I didn't want to have to say it. <laughs> do you have to... Uh, <laughs> So what year was that when you were starting? I started, uh, let's see, probably like 95, 96, somewhere around there. And then it was about 10 years after that you won Last Comic Stand. I won, yeah, yeah, exactly. uh, So I was dabbling at night and then then working at UNC PBS during the day. I was also very fortunate because I had access to great equipment, and I made friends with a lot of the videographers. So, and they knew I was doing stand up at night. Mm-hmm. And I'd say, hey guys, I don't know what you're doing this weekend, but I got free tickets to a comedy show. I just need you to bring these cameras in here and tape it, and I'll get you some beers or whatever. They're like, yeah, sure, man. So I got three cameras to come in and film me doing a feature set. <laughs> and I took that back and I edited it, you know, two channels of audio. I had one on the crowd, one on me, and I would make it sound even better than it was. And then I would add graphics to it with my phone number, blah blah blah, and and I had, and I could make copy. They had, we had tape decks. You could make what you you could make ten copies at one time, on tapes that were recycled that they were just free. So I made probably eighty copies of myself, <laughs> killing <laughs> on a on a Friday night, a great comedy club in front of a full house, and for free, and would just send those out. To every comedy club that I could get an address for, took a dumb little headshot, made up a fake resume, and at the very end of the tape, I actually put the clip of me getting kicked out of that Panthers game, uh-huh. and I just put that in there to see if they'd actually watch the whole thing. So I sent that to every comedy club I could get, and before you knew it, I was getting phone calls. So I I got and feature then did work. you go? Oh no, I did. Uh oh, I was like, oh crap, <laughs> I gotta do this now. And they wanted you to headline? No. No. It was all for feature work. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, Which then you, you could do. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I was young. I didn't have any debt. I was, you know, I had credit cards. I I thought, well, and, I, my, and my boss knew what I was doing at night. And so I remember going in one day after sending all these tapes out and, and getting all these offers. I, I went into my boss. I go, hey, uh, I think I'm, I'm going to have to quit. I got all these things lined up. And you know, this is my dream. And. Well, I guess I'm giving you my two weeks' notice. He goes, "All right. Well, when it when when it doesn't work, and you come back in here, I might give you your job back." And he was just sort of like tongue in cheek, you know, laughing at me. And um, that was of October of '98. That was the last time I had a real job. Wow. And I just hit the road full time, living mm-hmm. off credit cards, not making any money, didn't sell any merch. Like I was just, you know, fifty bucks a show. But I would I would drive all over the country for that. I I. I one time I had a gig in Fargo, North Dakota, and the next night I was supposed to be in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, which is basically the whole country, <laughs> north to south. That's a few day drive, yeah. isn't it? So I, yeah, I remember going uh, uh, featuring in North Dakota, saying like, "Can I get paid before the show? Because I'm I already got my car packed up. I got to run 
as soon as I'm done, I'm getting my car and I'm driving to Myrtle Beach. They go, eh, shy, whatever. So I, I said, thank you, good night. Brought the next guy. I run out the door, got in my car, drove all the way to South Carolina. I got there within an hour of the show to start. Uh, with no sleep. I mean, <laughs> no. I just pulled over to get gas and eat. So Wow. And all that for $75. Yeah. But I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't care. I was just, I, I knew that hey, I was doing. Obviously, you didn't know how to book a tour. <laughs> right. Well, you, you, didn't, you didn't have a choice. All oh, right. They just said, are you available this yeah. day? And I'd say yes to all of it. And yeah. just not, not worry about it. And just oh, go. Uh, and then you didn't have any, uh, the use of any fancy equipment to record yourself after that. No. No, I didn't. <laughs> so, uh, no, I didn't really make any tapes unless there were people there who offered, you know, like, oh, we got this little setup, you know, if you want to record. Yeah. But and not really, no. Yeah, our listeners may not have caught that, but when you said that you sent out these tapes of you killing, you used air quotes around yes. killing. Yes. Because it was... Like you weren't bombing, but it was you just amped it up a bit. Yeah, I did. I did good. Um, clearly, but I told to, because if you have two channels of audio, you know, one on my microphone on the stage, and we had another mic just sort of hanging. Well, they were on the cameras that were in the crowd, so you had the mic on the crowd as well. And so I would tell a joke, and then I could turn the volume up on the crowd to make it sound like I was getting a huger laugh than I was. And so, yeah, that was me air quoting killing because it sounded that way. But clearly the bookers have an eye for talent. And if somebody was up there being horrible and then yeah. manipulating it so it sounded like they were killing, they would go, well, I don't yeah, get this it. Is, this, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you had you had the ability. Yeah. Well, and, they, and, they, and back then, I don't know how it is today, the uh, club owners, the bookers, they liked high energy features right. um, because – even if the headliner doesn't work, at least the crowd is, gets to see something high energy, fun, goofy, you know, mm -hmm. not controversial, just a fun loving guy. And they go like, well, that that's a safe feature to book. So I think that helped as well. Yeah. And yeah. then, uh, and then you just kept at it, kept plugging along and then, uh, you know, doing that for a couple of years on the road, uh, I managed to get invited to certain festivals here and there and win some contests. I uh, uh, I think in 2000 was the first time in Montreal I got invited to the Just for Laughs Montreal Festival as a new face. And that was that would have been year 2000. And then after that, I did good enough to where I thought, well, let me uh, let me go couch surf in Los Angeles. I know some people that'll let me crash a day or two here, and and I had meetings set up, uh, you know. Because it is a festival, I met a lot of people after my set, and didn't have a manager or agent or anything. And and uh, but I had people in L.A. who would help me. So I had meetings with Ron Howard's company. Imagine not and him. And but, you said, "Hey, and, <laughs> I played OB too." Right. Well, it's crazy how full, full circle this is turning into be. But and then CBS and a couple of other, and they all basically saying the same thing. Like, well, you know, you, you're funny. It looks like you act out your stuff. You should maybe come out here and audition for stuff. And the, the, you ever think about doing commercials? I'm like, and these are just basic general meetings. You know, I'm thinking like, I'm going to go in there and pitch something and I'm going to be, I'm going to get a development deal for a million dollars. Like yeah. Michael Roof, the year before me, this guy named chicken, who got a million dollar deal. But, but it, it gave me the, uh, you know, sort of the confidence to uh, at least give L.A. a shot. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I moved to L.A. is after that Montreal festival. And, and you managed to book some yeah. roles? So then when I got when I moved to L.A., the first sort of me thing that I got was... Uh, so I moved to L.A., and it was not... It, I, most of my gigs were on the East Coast when I was featuring. You know, I had slowly headlined here and there on certain nights you know so i had maybe 45 minutes of stuff and my friend retta from parks and rec yeah. who's smarter than me uh already had a college agent and i'm like she goes well, why aren't you doing colleges i go what are you talking about she goes you don't have a college agent i go no it is that she goes you idiot and then she told me about this thing called naca the national association for campus activities and they book colleges all over the country in America. And um, she hooked me up with an agent. I sent them a tape. They go, you're perfect. And then what you do is you just go showcase at a conference 
for like a region of the country, and there's all these students there from different colleges, and then you just do like a 20-minute set, and if they like you, they will book you at their college. And before you know it, I had tons of work booked just doing colleges, but I had to headline. And I was I could only do about 45 comfortably, you know. What did they expect? An hour? Well, they said an hour. Yeah. But you get there and it's really just they're just students running it. They're not they're not keeping a clock on you. <laughs> yeah. So they don't care as long as they're laughing for 45 minutes. That's all that matters. And then I, and then from that I learned to do crowd work a little bit because I wanted to stretch it to an hour as much as I could. And that really helped develop me into like a better headliner because it wasn't like I was in the comedy club circuit getting judged by this booker who's going to talk to that club owner who's going to talk to that guy. It was just a bunch of kids. I didn't care as much if I bombed. So I took more risks and I tried more material and uh, things just led, um, you know, to, I, I learned to be a better headliner. Hang on one second. Um, but yeah, that helped me uh, grow to a, a better headliner. And um, that was the first year in LA. And that guy who was doing the, my uh, club dates, the college agent, was wanting to turn into a manager. And so he goes, why don't I manage you? I'm like, why not? And so he introduced me to my first uh, commercial agent. And so I went in, got this commercial agent, and that's when I got my first acting gig from that commercial agent for the Dodge Truck commercials. How long did they last? Those went from about 2002 to about 2004 or 5. Yeah. Yeah, I did, I did six of them. And they span that that time frame, and, and uh, now you keep bugging them, going, "Hey, let's bring this guy back." <laughs> you know, I have an idea. Uh, they won't do this, but uh, to me, it'd be funny. I might do it just as a spec, as a goof. You've you know, seen the Verizon or die or something. You've seen the yeah, exactly. Yeah, you've seen the Verizon wireless guy switch to Sprint. Do you know about this? Is this in Canada too? I don't know. So there's a spokesman for. Uh, uh, maybe it was AT T. Can you hear me now? Yeah, that guy. Yeah. Well, he quit that company. Oh yeah, I heard. And about now that. he's working for the competition. Yes. Yeah. So a la that, <laughs> I'm thinking the Hemi guy is now. Now he's grown up. He's a little. He's not a redneck anymore. He's sophisticated. He has a job. He's more hipster than redneck. He drives a Prius, and now the Hemi guy is the hybrid guy, <laughs> and so it's almost shot for shot like the first commercial. So, but now I'm in a Prius. I'm in a stoplight, and two rednecks pull up next to me, like what I used to be. Mm-hmm. And they're in the Dodge Ram truck with a Hemi engine. And they're looking down on us. And then one guy's like, "What? Is, what is that? A hybrid?" And I'm like, "Yeah, yeah, it's a hybrid." And then we floor it, just like another commercial. We floor it like we're going to race. And of course, the Dodge Ram beats me off the line. But the next shot you see is him pulling off to get gas, and I'm still going. <laughs> So there'd be a little spoof on the Dodge, but they won't, you know, no one's going to do that. But, yeah, I mean, I had, don't know. I had a blast doing this. You don't know. Yeah. It would be a little shot at Dodge. Yeah. yeah. A little wink and nod. But, hey, if the Verizon Wireless guy can go to Sprint, John Reap can go to to, to uh, Toyota. Exactly. <laughs> Did you have to work to keep your southern accent, or have you lost it? You know what's funny? Like, I mean, lost how, yeah, how, yeah, yeah. how it was originally. Uh, when I go back home to Hickory. 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 There are people who go, man, you you sound different. <laughs> I, I, one, uh, You're so L.A. A fr- yeah, they call me Hollywood. <laughs> Look at Hollywood and that fancy smartphone he's got. Thinks he's too good to have a cord on his phone. <laughs> but, <laughs> but now, that, that I remember sitting at a football game in my high school, and there's a guy named Eddie, and I was just talking to my friends, and he looked at me and goes, you sound different, and I don't like it. <laughs> 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 I go, I'm sorry, Eddie. Uh, but in L.A., like this, I sound, I still sound just as redneck to them. But what I, what I do is when I'm in Los Angeles, I will try to make an effort to enunciate the words that I'm saying. And sometimes that just catches on. You just, sort of, you just do that all the time. But I try to enunciate only because I want my order to be correct. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, like I don't want questions. I don't want to sit down and go, yeah, I'll take one of these. And they go like, where are you from? Like I don't want that conversation. <laughs> I just want to place my order. So I've learned to try to speak clearly and enunciate yeah. when, when time calls for it. And you're not a redneck. And, and this is a stereotype a lot of Southerners get. Sure. Uh, do you play it up? Well, I can. I, mean, I, I, don't, I, don't, uh, I don't shy away from it. 
but I don't totally embrace it. I'm I'm this weird hybrid. I tell people I'm a Metro Jethro. Yeah, you know, well read neck, uh, blue well color read scholar. Neck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you read? Uh, no. Okay, <laughs> but you're well. I, but I do have a college education. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, you know, I did two years of uh, community college and six years of a regular college, and I got a four year degree. Uh, but yeah. <laughs> Uh, but I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm this weird hybrid. I'm, you know, half, I'm a half, but I don't, mm-hmm. like I said, I don't like, I don't shy away from it. I can identify with those people. You know, I sound like those people, but I, 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 I haven't fished in it forever. I've only went hunting one time with my dad when I was a kid. I go to NASCAR events when they pay me. <laughs> for certain events, for Dodge, you know? Yeah. So I really, I'm not in that lifestyle. I'm more Metro than Jethro, mm-hmm. uh, but I sound this way. And I have stories from my childhood of that that lifestyle. So I look at it like I could go either way. You, uh, you're you on some, you're on a Netflix show. Yeah. With, uh, a special, Brad Paisley. Brad Paisley, who's a country singer. Yes. And... But there's all these comedians on it. Yeah. How did that come well, about? Well, Brad is a fan of comedy. Like, he um, – and he's a sci-fi guy, too. It's really strange. Like, you know, he, he's a Metro Jethro as well in a mm-hmm. weird way. He's married to an actress, has a nice home in Santa Barbara and in Nashville. So he he's bi-coastal like me, you know. But he uh, – but he's like the number one country music artist. He's always hosting the CMA Awards with Carrie Underwood. Uh, so he's always – Doing funny things, and now he's doing these funny commercials with the uh, nationwide with uh, Peyton Manning. But he's always liked comedy. Um, and in Nashville, there's a festival called the Wild West Comedy Fest that they've done for three years in a row. He just took that whole thing over um, because he loves comedy so much. Anyway, he wanted to, Netflix said, Do you want to do something? He goes, You know what? I've always kind of wanted to host a, a comedy night, and I've got funny songs. He already has funny songs, and I'll come up there with my guitar and I'll do a little. Q and A, and I'll do some funny songs, and I'll introduce some of my favorite comedians. That's great, and that's what he did. And, and some of the other, I know Nate Bargatze's on it. Nate Bargatze, who's from well, Tennessee, he's, he's a big uh, Vanderbilt fan. That's right. Yeah, Vanderbilt. Nate's been on this show, and uh, yeah, he's a he's a Southern guy, but he doesn't play that no. up. It's just who he is. It's just how he sounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, He's he like me, Metro Jethro a little bit, yeah. well redneck. He's more well read than I am. <laughs> he moved to New York and became a better stand up there. Right. Um, but he uh, he's doing really good. So he's on that special. Uh, you got John Heffron, who's on the John special. John Heffron, yeah. You got Sarah Tiana, and a guy named Mike Winfield. Mm-hmm. Uh, Sarah Tiana from Atlanta, been living in L.A. now for like twelve years. Yeah. Uh, Mike Winfield, I met just on the show. Um, I forgot where he was from. African American, very funny guy. So you had a good diverse crowd. I mean, you know, book of comics, and we shot it in Nashville, and it's on Netflix right now. It's called Brad Paisley's Comedy Rodeo. So people can see you there. Not, you can see me there. Not your own special on Netflix, right? Just me on it with other comics. On it, yeah. But that's a that's a. But I'm I on like Netflix. This. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you are, and and maybe they'll. I wonder, you know, now with the Louis C.K. news, yeah, and uh, well, just permeating society, yeah. Does that hurt stand up in any way? Will Netflix go? Because Louis oh, C.K. Right. was a big part of yeah, he was. Netflix. Yeah, it was funny. I just did. Like, an will episode. they go? Hey, let's just ease back on the comedy specials now. That's a good question. I don't know. And Dave, Dave Chappelle just put out two. Mm-hmm. Two at once, and the, since they were shot a while back, there are millennials dogging that sometimes. Yeah, you know, like the, that was, there was homophobic and all this stuff. We'll see. I'm excited to see what's going to happen. I don't know. I don't think. I think people, there will always be room for uh, stand up somewhere. Even even if Netflix gets tired of it, someone will someone will take it on because there'll be another person with a different spin on it. Well, sure. I mean, stand up through the decades has ebbed and flowed, but sure. it's always been there, it's always, and there's yeah. always been fans of it. Right. It's just right now, it seems like it's everybody of... has favorite comics. Yeah. Well, thanks to the internet. I mean, thanks to Netflix. Thanks to podcasts like this. Yeah. You know, there's lots of guys uh, doing that now who gaining fans just from their podcasts. Yeah. Hey, you have a couple podcasts. Yeah, I got two right now. Well, what? What are, you, what are you doing? I was just trying to. I'm trying to stay in the game. <laughs> Trying to stay Two, in the game. Though. Yeah, well, I got one with Sarah Tiana, 
It's called Fried. And it's he's from the South. I'm from the South. We both live in L.A. So it's it's on the All Things Comedy Network. Okay, it's once a, once a week, every Friday it comes out, and um, we just have a blast on that. We 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 have a lot of our family call in. My mother, who has the the thickest, sweetest Southern accent, will do movie reviews. Oh, nice. So we'll, she'll call in and tell us what she thought of Bad Moms. She goes, I just did not care for all that language. Right. You know. Because she's a saint. Yes, we she know. is. And then you have, um, we do uh, segments on there. We had Brad Paisley call in the first episode and promote the uh, the Netflix special. Um, so that's one. I got another one I just started with a buddy of mine named Kyle Davis. Kyle Davis, not a comedian, just a funny actor. He was uh, d- done lots of things. His most famous character is from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. He played a, a white... <laughs> a mentally challenged white rapper named Lil Kev. And so when he would rap, he was not mentally challenged. He was like hardcore Eminem. But then when he would stop rapping, he would fall back in this weird state, like a brain-damaged, uh, mentally challenged person or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but I met him doing a, a film called uh, Into the Storm. Uh, did a, it was a tornado movie that came out a couple years back. It was everywhere. But he was my buddy in the film. It, it turns out we happened to be neighbors. I mean, like, he's a mile from me. Right. And we became best friends. So we get together all the time, barbecue and drinking. So we, I said, why don't we just do a podcast? And so we have a podcast now called Brinkin' Duddies. And we just get together and get <laughs> hammered. And we talk about what we're drinking that day. We have secret shots. And we talk about, uh, you know, just life in Hollywood. So what's Lil Kevin Ramis? That's another show. It's a YouTube show. That one's got video component. <laughs> we start our own YouTube series. So, okay, so you were Ramus. I'm Ramus from Harold and Kumar Escape Guantanamo Bay. Which you were in. Which I was in. As Ramus. As Ramus. <laughs> yes, okay. So we thought, like, what if you took Ramus and Little Kev and they had their own YouTube show? Two of the smartest, most sophisticated characters <laughs> ever to grace the stage. Uh <laughs> We we have our own little YouTube show. It's called Little Kevin Ramos Try Stuff, and then I think the first episode we tried Cracker Jacks. Mostly, it's me explaining to Little Kev what these things are, and the sort of the joke is we we never try anything. It's it's me getting frustrated, kind of like uh, kind of like Tom Cruise getting frustrated at Rain Man. <laughs> mm-hmm. And I'm always trying to explain to him what the thing is, and we end up never trying anything. We did like 16 of them, and at the very end. We reveal in a rap song that little Kev will rap that we tried everything and we liked all of it. <laughs> so that is yet to come. Uh, right now, it's uh, episode four. We just did a, a fidget spinner, and um, it, it, and of course we didn't try the fidget spinner. We just talk about it. So I'm glad you said Cracker Jacks because you said we tried. Cra- I thought you were going to say we tried crack. crack. <laughs> yeah, let's put this on YouTube. Right, right. Hey, our first time. Well, that's what little Kev says. Like, yeah, I like crack. I said, no, little Kev. He said, that's a snack for white people. Like, any anyone can enjoy Cracker Jacks, not just for white people, little Kev. <laughs> so yeah. So you got uh, all those two podcasts and a video show. Yeah. And uh, you know you're touring Canada. Uh, I'll yeah. try to get to see you this weekend. If you're listening to this, you're too late. Yep. He was here a couple weeks ago. I was fantastic. You're fantastic. All weekend. <laughs> it was great. Shows. So standing room only. They had to add a show. <laughs> Encores <laughs> every night. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, maybe you'll be back here uh, sometime sooner than another nine years. I hope eight, so. Eight? Or what was it? Eight. Hey, you said eight. eight. I'm just going to go. Okay. I'm, not, I'm not checking your math. I'm just <laughs> okay. going to trust you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, hopefully, if people will come and people like what I do, I'll be back here sooner. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Got to get the word out. Yeah. Oh, that's what I was going to ask. Have, have the comedy club's audiences changed in the year that Donald Trump has been president? Yeah, it's funny. Like, um, Especially in your neck of the Well, way. it's funny. By the time I get up there, like, since I'm headlining, uh, there are usually two other comics going before me. And so by the time I get up there, it's like, we just, we just want to see John Reap. So I don't have to talk about it. But I do remember, like, right when it happened, like, like a day or two before the election, I happened to be on stage in Dallas, Texas, and it was like, you know, you had Hillary or Trump. And I, the only joke I ever made about it, and I'm not a political guy, I don't want people, I don't want to lose half my audience. So I never look, try to divide the crowd. I just, you know, I'm just me. Uh, but I did make this one joke. I came out on stage and I go like, I, guys, this is tough, tough time of year. I know it's, we're all going to have to, this is the toughest decision 
that I've ever had to make in my life because I just love them both so much. <laughs> <laughs> it's a win-win. We're going to be fine. Why can't they both be president? And that was it. And I just moved on. And that let, let, let some air out of the room. And uh, everybody's like, oh, okay. At least that, he's addressing it. Yeah, that is a yeah. take I have not heard. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I just love them both so much. No, said no one ever except John. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Yeah. All right. Anything else, John? Uh, that's it. Good to see you. Good There's see people you. knocking down our door. I know. I'm switching Fo- rooms. Getting phone calls. Yeah. And you got sides to. Uh, oh, that's to right. Record. I got to audition. Yeah. I got to see if I can rope you into reading this with me. I will. But we'll have to switch rooms first. Thank you, guy. Thank you, John. See you again. All right. Goodbye. Happy 2018, everyone. Yes, we are now into the new year. John Reap saw us through the 2018. Thanks to him for that mid-November conversation, and I'm glad we finally got it on the air. Uh, Happy New Year to you, or if you're listening on podcast, as I say, happy whatever day it is you're listening. A little update. John did get me to read his sides with him for an audition he taped for a show. I think it's on Fox. So if he ever gets that part, I want to cut. I want uh, 5%. I'll take 5% for helping him with his audition. Okay, that's it. Uh, Again, Happy New Year. And uh, we'll talk to you next week. I think we're going to do some best of 2017 episodes. So stay tuned for those. Thanks for listening. Good night.